given any integer n greater than or equal to 2, let capital M of n be the n by n matrix defined as follows, where capital M sub ij of n denotes the entry in row i column j of capital M of n. So our desired ij entry is going to be j over j minus 1 squared if i is j plus 1 and j is greater than 1, and it's going to be 1 if i is 2 and j is 1, and 0 otherwise. So if n is equal to 4, so let's try constructing capital M of 4 using these conditions. We know the easiest part, when i is 2 and j is 1, we're going to have 1. So row 2, column 1. So row 2, column 1, we are going to have entry of 1. Now, when our row number is our column number plus 1, and we're not looking at the first column, we are going to have j over j minus 1 squared. So let's look at each column. We're not looking at the first column because j has to be greater than 1. When j is 2, when we're looking at the second column, our row number has to be 3. So we're looking at this entry right here. And that entry is going to be our column number over column number minus 1 squared. So 2 over 1 squared. When j is equal to 3, so when we look at the third column, our desired row number is going to be 4. 3 plus 1 is 4. And that's right here. And the entry that goes there is going to be 3 over 2 squared because j is 3 in the third column. You and the rest of the entries are going to be zeros. So this is our m of 4. From here, we're going to define matrix A of n as follows, where capital A of n is going to be the sum of all the non-negative powers of capital M of n. So we're raising m of n to the 0 power, which is going to be the identity matrix. And we have m of n to the first power, m of n to the second power, m of n to the third power, and so on. A natural question that may arise in your mind when you see this definition of a of n is, is a of n even well defined? Because when we add a bunch of powers of m of n, it may be the case that some of the entries are going to diverge. For example, let's say m of n, this is not going to be m of n for any value of n, but let's say m of n is the identity matrix 1, 0, 0, 1. If that's the case, our a of n is going to be the identity matrix plus identity matrix plus now any power of the identity matrix is going to be the identity matrix. So we're just adding a bunch of identity matrices. And obviously, we're adding a bunch of ones. We're adding infinitely many ones for the top left entry, which means that that entry is not going to be defined. But as we'll see, for this problem, for the M of n's that we are actually concerned with, this definition of A of n works fine. We're not going to have any problems with this definition of A of n. And the reason for that will be revealed soon enough. But let's finish reading the question for now. We wish to find the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from j equals to 1 to n of a sub nj of n divided by n minus 1 squared. So we're looking at the nth row and our j is going from 1 to n. So we're just adding up every single entry in row n. And of course, we're dividing that by n minus 1 squared. But before we go on, I'd like to take this time to recognize two people. And the first one is Denise, who made this week's weekly math challenge possible by proposing a similar problem. And the second person is Mr. L, who was the very first person to correctly answer this problem last week. A huge shout out to Denise and Mr. L. Turning our attention back to the problem, let's think about what happens to a matrix that has non-zero entries in this diagonal, so the second one from the main one, when we raise it to second power, third power, fourth power, and so on. Let's look at a more general version of capital M of 4 by looking at this matrix M, where A1, A2, and A3 are greater than 0. So what is going to happen when we square this matrix? Well, to find an entry in m squared, for example, the entry in row 2, column 1, we are going to have to multiply the row 2 of m by column 1 of m. And we see that when we multiply this row and column, we are going to have a1 times 0 plus 0 times a1 plus 0 times 0 plus 0 times 0, which is of course just going to get us 0. Now realize 
it is really hard to get a non-zero entry. If you multiply the second row by, let's say, the third column, then we're going to have 0 times a1, 0 times 0, 0 times 0, and 0 times a3. That's going to be 0. Notice that for us to have a non-zero entry, so for us to have something other than 0, the non-zero entries have to be multiplied to each other, and that's the key. The entry in third row, first column, so let's look at this. For this one, a1 and a2 are in the same position. a2 is the second entry in the row, and a1 is the second entry in the column. So they are going to be multiplied to each other, and we are going to have a1, a2 in the row 3, column 1 slot. We get lucky again in row 4, column 2, because in row 4 and column 2, a2 and a3 are in the same position, third to be exact. So we're going to have a2, a3 in row 4, column 2. Now here's what I assert. The rest of the entries are going to be zeros. For the rest of the entries, the non-zero entries that we multiply are not going to be in the same positions. We will prove this, but before we do so, let's think about what happens for m cubed. We're multiplying m squared by m to get m cubed, and the only non-zero entry in m cubed, I assert once again, is going to be the row 4 and column 1. And you realize for row 4 and column 1, we have a2 and a3 in the second position, a1 in the second position, so we are going to have a1, a2, a3. And the rest of the entries are going to be zeros. What happens when we raise m to the fourth power? Well, m to the fourth is going to be m cubed times m, so to get a non-zero entry, we have to have it in row 4, because row 4 is the only row in m cubed that has a non-zero entry. But notice that this non-zero entry is in position 1, and which column has a non-zero entry in position 1 in m? None of them. So this is telling us that for m4, the last row is going to be 0, and all the other rows are of course going to be zeros. Which means that m to the 5th is going to be the zero matrix, m to the 6th, m to the 7th, and so on. So, inside the definition of a of n, notice that m of n to the nth power is actually going to be the zero matrix, and n plus first power, n plus second power, and so on, are going to be zero matrices as well. So, when we are summing this up, instead of summing from zero to infinity, we are really summing from zero to n minus one. Which means that for the matrices that we care about, our a of n is well defined. And in our case, our n was equal to 4, so when we raised it to the 4th power, we got the 0 matrix. But how do we prove this rigorously? We wish to prove that the non-zero entries are going to move diagonally. It's going to start at this diagonal, then move to this diagonal, then finally end up at this corner entry, and from there it's going to disappear. The matrix is going to become the 0 matrix. Another way of saying that is that in M, our entries had the property i is equal to j plus 1, row number is column number plus 1, and in M squared, we have i equals to j plus 2. 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 2 is 4. And finally, we have i is equal to j plus 3, row 4, column 1. So we want to prove that the entry ij in M to the k power is non-zero if and only if i is equal to j plus k. To prove it, I'm going to use mathematical induction. When k is equal to 1, so when we are just looking at our regular matrix, notice that by definition, our entries are non-zero if and only if i is j plus 1, if our row number is column number plus 1. If you remember, let's go back up, that was in our definition i is j plus 1, and even for i equals to 2 and j equals to 1, we have i equals to j plus 1. Now that we have the base case, let's look at the inductive case. So let's think about what happens when we multiply m to the k by m. By inductive assumption, we know m to the k power is going to have a non-zero entry at i minus k spot in i's row. Because a j is i minus k, if our row number is i, then the column or the spot that we are talking about, the position we are talking about is going to be i minus k. And in M, if you look at it in J's row, M is going to have the non-zero entry at J plus 1 spot. And that's by definition once again, if our column number is J, our row number has to be J plus 1 for capital M. 
And this is telling us that if we have a non-zero entry in m to the k plus the first power, then the positions of the non-zero entries must be the same. So i minus k is going to be j plus 1, or i is j plus k plus 1, which proves our lemma. Note that our lemma shows that in m to the fourth, we can have non-zero entry only if i is equal to j plus 4, but that means i is at least 5 because j is a positive integer. But since our matrix is 4 by 4, we cannot have a row number greater than 4. That tells us that when we raise m to the fourth power, we are going to get the zero matrix. In the same way, if m was n by n instead of 4 by 4, if we raise it to n's power, we are going to get zero. Now we want to add up identity matrix m of n, m of n squared all the way to m of n to the n minus first power. Then we want to add up the final row of that matrix of A of n. So what do we have on the final row of A? Well, we are going to have A1, A2, A3 from m cubed. Then we're going to have A2, A3 from m squared. We are going to have A3 from m. And then we're going to have one from the identity matrix and hopefully you see the pattern. We have a3, then a2 times a3, then a1 times a2 times a3. So let's prove one more lemma, that a of n, n minus k, where k is greater than or equal to 1, is going to be a sub n minus 1, so that's what we have in n minus first entry. Then to go to the next entry, we attach a sub n minus 2, then we attach a sub n minus 3, and so on, and we end with a sub n minus k. Another thing to realize is that this n minus k entry in nth row is going to come from m to the k power. n minus first entry comes from m, n minus second entry comes from m squared, n minus three entry comes from m cubed, and so on. To prove it, note that for the base case, the n minus first entry in the nth row is going to be a sub n minus one by the definition, because in our m, we had a3 or a sub n minus 1 in row n column n minus 1. For the inductive case, let's remember that in the nth row, so in the nth row, we are going to have non zero entry in n minus k spot. And by inductive hypothesis, that entry is going to be a sub n minus 1, a sub n minus 2, all the way to a sub n minus k. Now we're looking at the entry in n comma n minus k minus 1 in m to the k plus first power, because we want to take away the power from n. So the column, it should be column, because we're multiplying n entry in certain row and a certain column. And the column number should be n minus k minus 1, because that's the column we're looking at. So it should be n minus k spot, so the spots agree. Now, in the first column, we have a1. In the second column, we have a2. So in n minus k minus 1 column, we're going to have a sub n minus k minus 1. And this completes our induction. When we go from n minus k spot to n minus k minus 1 spot in row n, we multiply by this a sub n minus k minus 1. So in general, our final row is going to be a1, a2, all the way to a sub n minus 1, then a2, a3, all the way to a2, n minus 1, then a3, a4, all the way to a2, the n minus 1, then ending with a2, the n minus 1, then just 1. So these are the entries that we want to add up. Now let's think about what a sub n is in our case. In our case, a sub 1 is always 1, because the entry at 2 comma 1 is 1. Then the next entry is going to be 2 over 1 squared, because we're looking at the second column. Then we're going to have 3 over 2 squared, because we go down to third column, and so on. So we know a sub 1 is 1, a sub 2 is 2 over 1 squared, a sub 3 is 3 over 2 squared, and all the way to a sub n minus 1 being n minus 1 over n minus 2 squared. And notice what's happening. a sub 1 multiplied all the way to a sub n minus 1, that's 1 times 2 squared over 1 squared, times 3 squared over 2 squared, times 4 squared over 3 squared, all the way to n minus 1 squared over n minus 2 squared. And the 2 squared are going to cancel out, 3 squared are going to cancel out, and so on, until we only have n minus 1 squared over 1 squared left. So this is simply n minus 1 squared over 1 squared. Now, how about this thing? Well, that's the same thing, except we don't have a sub 1, so we are going to get the same thing. Now, how about the next term? So let me actually write down the next term. For this one, 
we start with 3 squared over 2 squared because that's a sub 3. So we're going to have a 2 squared on the bottom. So we're going to have n minus 1 squared over 2 squared. And this pattern is of course going to continue. The next one is going to be n minus 1 squared over 3 squared until we hit a sub n minus 1 squared, which is n minus 1 squared over n minus 2 squared. So we are summing up n minus 1 squared times 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared all the way to plus 1 over n minus 2 squared. And to this, we have this additional 1. So what do we want to do? We want to divide this by n minus 1 squared and take the limit as n goes to infinity. So when we divide this by n minus 1 squared, we are going to get 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared, 1 over n minus 2 squared, and then this thing is going to be 1 over n minus 1 squared. If you have taken calculus, you may know that sum from n equals to 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared is pi squared over 6. And since that's exactly what we have as n goes to infinity, this thing is going to approach 1 plus pi squared over 6. We know our final answer is 1 plus pi squared over 6.